Amen. Thank you, Garrison. Thank you very much for blessing us this morning. You have your Bibles. In a little while, we'll be reading from 2 Samuel, the 18th chapter. 2 Samuel, chapter 18. I, I'm going to stun some of the younger group of our crowd, but when I was growing up, there were only four television stations. There were actually only three prior to our receiving a new color TV in 1970. It was an RCA set, and it had UHF channels, which at that time you had to have UHF to be able to get ABC. And I still remember that fall day in 1970. It was a Friday afternoon when they delivered that TV, hooked it up to the antenna, and for the first time that evening, we watched the Brady Bunch. And it was fascinating, color TV. But what I remember most about my youth and television is not only the lack of variety, but that every day the new news was watched. And as soon as the new news was complete, then those theme songs began to come on that I can still hear in my head. They were called soap operas. They were, for those of you who don't know, and I don't even know if soap operas are still on TV or not, but they were created by Procter & Gamble, these dramatic stories where there was always a cliffhanging tragedy one day to be picked up the next, and all with the intention of selling you new kinds of laundry detergent and dish soap. But I remember that theme song for that one that had that kind of a tinkering music behind it, and it said, like the sands through the hourglass. So what was that? Was that from Lindsay? Oh. Is that show still on TV? It is? Okay. Some of you are shaking your head. You're like, you're not afraid. You're going to be ashamed to admit you know that. Well, I'll remember some of those stories and having to begrudgingly watch that stuff while um, I was a child. But our story today with David and Absalom makes those dramatic, tragedy-filled, intrigue stories of the soap opera seem like child's play. David's choices have created a, a real mess for himself. He had his affair with Bathsheba, which led to him having absolutely no moral standing in his family. Amnon lusted after his stepsister Tamar. He raped her, and then out of that rape grew a resentment from Absalom toward Tamar, and he waited four years, plotted with him at a, and, and at a dinner gathering one night. All of the brothers of Absalom seized upon Amnon, and he was killed. Absalom ran for his life and hid for a little while from David, and the Scripture says his grief for Amnon began to subside, and his longing for Absalom grew. Absalom finally returned home and after a brief bit of respite began to calculate ways in which he could become king. You remember a few weeks ago I told you about David moving the capital, capital of Israel from Hebron to Jerusalem. He, he actually captured a neutral Canaanite city which would become Jerusalem. And there he set up his his kingdom and his throne, but there was still that resentment in Hebron that we have lost the capital, and we lost those jobs, and we lost that prestige, and we've lost that, the attention of the king. Absalom, beginning to figure out ways that he could become king around his father, started going back to Hebron and started making political inroads with those people and their resentment. And he would show up in the city gate where the government was very loosely organized and he would say to them, I have no authority, but if I were king, I would listen to your complaints and I would say, you are right and you are just and I would rule in your favor. And person after person walked up and Absalom listened to their complaints and he said, I don't, there's nothing I can do. But if I could do something, I would rule in your favor. It's perfect political philosophy. 
He's listening to their complaints, finding out what their problems are, and with absolutely no strings attached saying, I would do exactly what you want done in order to make you happy. And the scripture says that everyone in Hebron thought well of Absalom. So one day Absalom tells his father, I have to go back to Hebron in order to keep a vow. And he sends words through messengers to Hebron. He said, as soon as you hear the trumpet blow, everyone in the city is supposed to stand up and shout, Absalom has been made king of Israel at Hebron. He goes to Hebron, the trumpet blows, people shout, Absalom has been made king, and word gets back to Jerusalem where David hears in his palace and he runs for his life. Now here's where the intrigue really starts, and it's very complicated, and I'm just going to hit the high points. You can't really tell in this story who can be trusted and who's a secret agent and who's a double agent and who's just looking out for themselves. David sends one of his most trusted advisors back to Absalom and he tells him, he said, you tell Absalom, just as I was with your father, I'll now be with you. And then you come back and tell me what he's saying. Who's he to believe? In the meantime, Ziba now shows up among David's men, one of his, the servants of Mephibosheth, and he says to the king, Mephibosheth is casting in with Absalom, but I've brought you food and all these provisions for the troops. And he goes back and forth, not knowing who to trust and why, and finally, battle is going to come in the woods of Ephraim. There are no woods in Ephraim now. It's been over the years between deforestation, cutting down the wood to build homes and this and that and cutting down the forest to plant crops and then drought. Ephraim now is just a rocky area in, in the Middle East. But that time it was a forest, a dense forest. And that's where the battle is going to be joined. And Absalom has all of these green soldiers around him. And David has seasoned troops at the command of a seasoned general, Joab. It's not going to be any kind of battle at all. And David pleads with them, please, 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 please let me go. You remember earlier, he didn't go to battle and he stayed on, in Jerusalem and he walked around on his rooftop and it got him into trouble. But this time he wants to go. They said, no, David, if you're killed, we have no reason to be fighting. If you're killed, then Absalom becomes king anyway. You stay back here and let us protect you. So he stayed home, and Absalom is with his green soldiers running around in that forest. And when David's seasoned soldiers began to join the battle, it turns into chaos. And Absalom summons the royal transportation of the day. He calls for a mule. And he jumps up on this mule and he's trying to ride through the forest. And as he is riding along through the forest, his most prideful physical characteristic is too high in the air. Absalom has a beautiful mane of hair. The scripture says that when Absalom got his annual haircut, it weighed six pounds with what they cut off. This thick mane of hair is flowing in the wind as he's riding that mule and it becomes stuck in the fork of an oak tree and the mule keeps running and Absalom is now hanging by the hair of his head. It's one of those spots. You're in the middle of a battle. You don't know how close the enemy is. You can't say anything. All he can do is hang in silence and wish for a pair of scissors. And he just hangs there. And one of David's soldiers sees him hanging, goes back to Joab and says, Absalom is hanging in a tree. He can be captured. And Joab said, you saw him hanging in a tree and you didn't kill him? He said, no, I, I heard David tell you, be kind to my son Absalom. Don't kill him. Joab said, I'm not going to stay here and listen to any more of this. I would have gladly given you ten pieces of silver and a new belt if you would have already killed him. Joab goes out and, well, let's just read the scripture together. Reading in verse 9 of chapter 18. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. 
And Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, and he was left hanging between heaven and earth while the mule he was under went on without him. And a man saw it and told Joab, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. And Joab said to the man who told him, What, you saw him? Why then didn't you strike him there to the ground? I would have been glad to give you ten pieces of silver and a belt. But the man said to Joab, Even if I had in my hand the weight of a thousand pieces of silver, I would not raise my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king commanded you and Ababishaw and Itai, saying, For my sake protect the young man Absalom. On the other hand, if I've dealt treacherously against his life and there's nothing hidden from the king, then you yourself would have stood aloof. Joab said, I'll not waste any time like this with you. And he took three spears in his hand and he thrust them into the heart of Absalom. And while he was still alive in the oak, and then the ten men from Absalom, arm, Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. And then Joab sounded the trumpet, and the troops came back from pursuing Israel, for Joab restrained the troops. The unnamed soldier tells Joab, I wouldn't touch him for anything, because as soon as I did were to get back to the king, and then you would stand there with your hands in your pockets and say, I didn't have anything to do with it, and I would take the punishment for killing the king's son. Joab had none of that. He wanted the military expediency of ending the battle right now. As soon as Absalom is gone, the army, the, the war is over. So they go out and they kill him twice, according to this passage of Scripture. They kill him with, with Joab, kills him with three spears to the heart, and then they take him down, and the ten armor bearers of Joab kill him again. And then they go and they take the body of the king's son and they throw it down in a ravine and they cover it over with rocks in a very unceremonious battle and it is over. It all started when David got up with an idle mind and walked around the rooftop and saw Bathsheba. And he lost his moral standing and that led to anger in the children and he couldn't do anything about their misbehaving. And one thing led to another and one son is dead and a daughter is raped and now this son is dead. Absalom, the tall, good-looking orator of Israel is dead. Two messengers run from the scene of the battle. The first runs toward David and gets there and he can, David says to him, do you have word of the battle? And the messenger says to him, oh yes, yes, the battle is over and all is well with the king. And he says, what about Absalom? And he said, king, there was a great battle and I am not sure the results. The second one comes running up and he tells him, king, all is well with you. And David says to him, what about Absalom? And he said, oh, that every man who ever challenges the king would meet the same fate. And David knew his son was dead. His words were, the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I have died instead of you, O Absalom, my son, my son? It's one of those nonsensical statements made in grief. Oh, that I had died instead of you. David didn't mean that. If David would have died instead of Absalom, all he had to do was stay home. Absalom would have taken care of him. It's like Elijah running from Jezebel and when he gets into safe territory he sits under a broom tree and he tells the Lord, Lord, I'm the only righteous person left in the whole kingdom and I might as well die. Lord, just go ahead and take me now. He, the prophet didn't mean that. If he wanted to die, all he had to do was stop running. Jezebel would have killed him. All David had to do was stay home and all this this is not Greek of grief of wanting to change spots. This is grief about choices. This entire sad story in the nation of Israel 
is about choices. It's about David's choice to stay home from a battle and become bored with his wealth of his own life. It's about his choice to wander around on the roof looking down into the courtyards of his neighbors. It's about his choice to send a messenger. And then when he finds out that she is married, and I'm married, not only married, but married to one of the soldiers who is fighting for him, he makes a choice. And then there are choices with his sons and with his daughters. It's choice after choice after choice. This is the story of the choices that Absalom made. Rather than dealing with justice and rather than confronting his father with the injustice of the rape of his sister, he made a choice to take matters into his own hands and then a choice to go to Hebron and then a choice to start the coup and a choice to bring military might against his father. He made a choice. And then Joab, who's the military commander, listens to the word of David, don't harm my son, but he makes a choice to end the battle is worth more than the words of the king. And they kill Absalom. That's a choice. It's a choice that Joab will pay for later in the story. But in all these choices, there's this one wise man, unnamed in the story, the one who saw Absalom hanging by the hair of his head from the tree, he's the only wise person in the bunch. And he heard the words of the king and he honors the words of the king. He's not going to raise his sword against the king's son. And when Joab presses him as to why he didn't disobey the king, he says to him, if I'd have disobeyed the king and the king found out, you would have done nothing but leave me twisting in the wind. The one wise man and his choices. Now it's right here in this point in the sermon when I should probably press you with some kind of application about the choices you've made in your life. Some of them good and some of them not so good. Some of them you're proud of and some of them you hope nobody knows about. But you know, I don't think I really have to make that application for you. I think you're probably already thinking about those things yourself. Stumbled onto a nice little recommendation from Amazon, a book they thought I might like, which is their way of saying, would you buy something else? The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. Harold has retired in southern England from the lifetime of working in a brewery, a brewery where he does not drink the product, he is quick to say. And he has retired to a quiet life of just kind of coexisting with his wife, Noreen, and, and, and ignoring their widower, or avoiding their widower neighbor, Rex, next door, who always wants to talk. One day, they're sitting at the breakfast table arguing about how to best put on the butter on the toast and the jam on the toast. And a letter arrives, and it is from Queenie Hennessy. He hadn't heard of Queenie Hennessy in 20 years. He opens the letter, and it says, Dear Harold, I know it's been a long time. I wanted you to know that I am on the hospice at Berwick on Tweed in Scotland. I've been diagnosed with cancer and I've had one operation and it did not work and I am at peace with that. But I wanted to say thank you for your kindness, Queenie. So he mulls that letter over for a while and goes to the cabinet and takes out a sheet of paper and sketches back a note of thanks, friendship, consolation. Puts it in an envelope, puts a stamp on it, and tells his wife, Maureen, I'm going to go mail this letter. And he starts out, and as he goes toward the mailbox, he's mulling over his words, and they seem so inadequate. 
So he decides to mull them over further, and he walks past the first mailbox, and then the second mailbox, and then the third mailbox, and pretty soon he's on the north side of town, and he's out of mailboxes, and he still hasn't got the letter mailed. So he decides he'll walk on to the next town and consider his words further and put it in the mailbox there. And before you know it, he's come up with this idea in his head as he's walked along, I am going to walk to Scotland and I am going to tell her what her life has meant to me. He's 70 years old, wearing a windbreaker and deck shoes. Nothing else on his person. He's five miles away from home that evening when he stumbles into a pub, orders a lemonade and an order of fish and chips, eat out under the, ba- eat out under the umbrella out front, calls his wife Maureen and says, I am walking to Scotland to tell Queenie Hennessy what her life has meant to me. She chastises him on the phone for being stupid, among other things. But they hang up the phone and the next morning he takes off in his deck shoes and he's walking north. He doesn't even know exactly how to get there so he buys a map along the way. And I'll save you all the details of the trip. But as he walks with terrible shoes through all kinds of weather in painful conditions, he replays the choices of his life. He thinks back to the day when he was 13 years old and he watched his mom pack her suitcase, walk out the front door and never come back. He thinks about the day when he's 16 and his father comes in with a new overcoat, presents him with a new overcoat. He puts it on in the entryway of the house, models it for his father and his newest girlfriend. His dad pats him on the back, opens the door and says, good luck to you, and cast him out into the world at 16 years of age. He walked down the street, saw a help wanted sign at a brewery, and that was where he would work the remainder of his life. He talks about raising his son David and Maureen and how he just never could quite connect with the boy. The boy was just so much smarter than he was. He said, people often wondered, how could such a smart boy come from a man like you? And all through the book, there is this tension that David never comes home and David never writes and David never calls, but one day he's going to. And as he walks, Maureen is sitting at home, wringing her hands, at first angry, and then she begins to replay the choices of her life. Little things. Little things along the way that had an impact. And as the novel unfolds, you realize why David never calls, never writes, and never comes home. He died. He died, and the two of them were never able to speak of it. So she moved into her room down the hall where every night she turned the lock, and he stayed in his room, and they lived in silence. And she begins to realize she didn't know Queenie, and Queenie had come to see her, She had come to see her on the afternoon after she had been fired from the bookkeeping department working with Harold. The night before, in his grief, Harold had gone into his boss's office angry. His boss was a real jerk. A man who married frequently and physically beat his wives. He went into that office and he smashed the boss's crystal clown set into a million pieces. And the next morning when Queenie arrives for work, the boss is in an outrage and and she puts two and two together and she realizes that the grieving father has gone in there and she has destroyed, and he has destroyed those clowns. And so she walks in and she says to the boss, I'm sorry I was dusting. It's my fault. I did it. He fires her on the spot. Queenie goes to Maureen and she tells... She says, tell Harold, 
He's always been kind to me and it's the least I could do for him in his moment of need. And she left and for 20 years they never heard from her. But Maureen chose to never tell Harold what Queenie did. She let him suffer in his own sin that Queenie paid for with his lack of courage. He arrives 87 days later at Queenie's bedside and her cancer is so bad she is unable to speak. He sits on the bed. He holds her hands. He tells her, I'm sorry and thank you. Maureen drives up, happens to get there a few hours after he has seen Queenie in the hospice. They sit on a bench in the park looking out over the North Sea. He's full of remorse. And she's full of love. He said, I never should have left. I should have just sent the note. I never should have walked up here. She said, no. You're walking up here has given us our lives back. And he says, but what about it? She pushes her hands over his mouth, her finger over his mouth, and she says, shh. Those choices are in the past. We get to start over today. And the two of them walk off toward their car, doing something they haven't done since David died, holding hands. Choices matter. If there are any lessons from David's life, it's that choices matter. And Absalom's and Joab's and the unnamed man. And the wonderful thing is that even when we make bad choices, the grace of God can put them right. Some of us have been living for 20 years with bad choices that have festered inside of us and crippled us. Some of us have been living out the blessings of fortunate choices that have blessed us for our whole lives. But every single one of us have choices. We wished we could go back and say, oh, if I could undo. You can't undo. But that's where the grace of God is. Joab comes into David, and he pulls him up off by the shoulders, and he says to him, King, these men out here have fought for your, for your kingdom and for your life, and you are sitting in here mourning a son who wanted to take your life. You stand up before these troops, and you thank them for their service. And David gets up, and by getting up, Joab was the grace of God to him, and he enabled him to go on with the rest of his life and he never made those poor choices again. We live with choices but it's the grace of God that gives us a fresh start. What about you? Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we're surrounded by the choices of our lives words that we said or we didn't say, actions that we took or we didn't take. Apologies that we didn't offer. Prideful stands that drove a wedge. Father, in this hour of invitation, I ask that your grace reach down into the choices of our lives. Give us a fresh moment. 
a new start. And the ability to go forward in your love. Father, may you, Grace, speak to us in this day and pull us up past all the things that we can't undo. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is, I have decided to follow Jesus. Perhaps you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as Savior. You come. Accept him as Lord and Savior and make that choice to leave everything else in the past. Perhaps you're here looking for a church home. Come and join with us. Perhaps you'd like to have a word of prayer, of peace, of reconciliation, of intercession for your needs. Whatever the need, let's deal honestly with the Lord and with the Holy Spirit in this time. Let's stand and sing together. I have decided to follow Jesus.